airplane designed to rule the skies in the 21st century, the F-22 Raptor. With unprecedented stealth, speed, and maneuverability, this plane will be unbeatable in a dogfight. And in fact, it's so advanced, it will make dogfighting obsolete. It's been 15 years in development, a program filled with exhilarating success and disturbing failure. Now we'll unlock closed doors for an in-depth look at the future of fighter aviation. And we'll take a breathtaking ride with an F-22 test pilot. This is F-22 number 001, the first development model ever built. The goal for this new airplane is clear, and the expectations are enormous. The F-22 Raptor must be the best fighter in the world. At Edwards Air Force Base, California, a fortress of secrecy surrounds the premier test flights of this 21st century warplane. Our cameras have been cleared for access, escorted at every turn. An elite group of America's finest test pilots have gathered here to take this revolutionary new plane into the unknown, one step at a time. Lieutenant Colonel Steve Rainey is the first Air Force test pilot to fly this remarkable fighting machine. In the past, combat commanders looked to establish air superiority. With the F-22, air superiority isn't good enough. On future battlefields, the Raptor must exert total air dominance. The airplane is incredibly capable. It is uh, absolutely revolutionary in its capabilities. And I think that that's the key difference. Air dominance is air superiority, but is on a much grander scale with much greater capability. That capability is sometimes called first look, first shot, first kill by the Air Force. In essence, any potential enemy can be shot down before they even know they've been spotted. The F-22 is the first plane in the history of winged combat capable of achieving such an overwhelming advantage. Test cards are the script for the upcoming mission. They list the maneuvers and goals for the next flight. Steve's test flight is scheduled for 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. The test team is working towards four major objectives for the F-22. They want the plane to be stealthy, virtually undetectable to the enemy. It must supercruise, fly for extended periods at supersonic speeds without afterburner. They expect the F-22 to be the most maneuverable fighter in the sky. The pilots should have no limits on their high angle of attack or angle of flight. And they're hoping the avionics will be so advanced that the pilots will be able to devote their full attention to the business of fighting the enemy. The F-22 will be far more than an improved version of today's fighters. If you look down through history and you look at a comparison between, say, the top fighter of World War II, the P-51, and 25 years later with the advent of the jet age, the F-4, to me that's a revolutionary jump. We've jumped from propellers to jet engines, we've jumped from manual bombing and manual gun sights to some computed capabilities in the F-4. Other airplanes like the F-15, the F-16, in my mind, have been evolutionary. I believe we've taken that next revolutionary step with the F-22. The F-22 program will cost over $70 billion. Giants of the aviation industry have joined forces to develop the airplane. Lockheed Martin and Boeing are building the airframe. Pratt & Whitney is building new engines. Pre-flight briefings must include representatives from these companies as well as Air Force personnel. 
Aeronautical engineer Mary Beth O'Loughlin is the test conductor, the head of the team. She leads the testing for the F-22. Mary Beth's got to manage 30 to 40 highly specialized engineers, each of whom is busy testing and monitoring his own set of in-flight data, and relayed all of this information back to the pilot in simple, straightforward language at critical moments during the flight. With a new airplane, every maneuver, no matter how simple, enters uncharted territory. We are obviously trying to go up higher and faster with the airplane. And we take baby steps towards that, um, just flying lower and slower until we get good data and the engineers have a chance to analyze that data and make sure it agrees with their predictions, then we can go ahead and continue up higher and faster. What we've got is a race car that's still in the parking lot because of the restrictions on the flight envelope. We're still driving around parking it and doing little donuts in the parking lot. We haven't gotten it out on the racetrack yet to really let it out. And eventually we maneuver the airplane to higher G-loads, which is what we'll be doing uh, in the coming months. We'll be going to supersonic speeds with the airplane, demonstrating the super cruise capability, and starting to slow it down to the higher angles of attack and the dogfighting regime. Right now we're in the phase with the F-22 that's very high visibility. Everybody's very worried. All of the terrifying things that have happened to me in the past have come in the part of the program where everything's business as usual. Business as usual is the most terrifying part of the program because people then back down. I have never been terrified or frightened on a high-risk test. I have had this holy bejesus scared out of me during uh, low-risk tests. And the reason is everyone's relaxed. After more than two hours in the team briefing, the pilots and mission control reconvene for more last-minute planning. No detail can be overlooked. Surprises can be deadly. Tomorrow's mission will focus on testing the handling qualities of the Raptor. If, if you're upwind, then the crosswind kind of helps you when you make your correction. So my thought is, if I've got a slight right crosswind, then I'll be on the left side, so I have to fight the crosswind coming back. I mean, it's fine. I, it'll be interesting to see how well we turn 90 degrees. I have never turned at 90 degrees with brakes on. That's all. So that's, that's and then you have to turn back. back. Here, so yeah. But today's yeah. test pilots must do more than fly. They must integrate flying ability and engineering expertise. The role suits Steve. He graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1980 and went on to receive a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Miami. I'm not doing high G. And for me, it was an opportunity to take the engineering background and marry it with the flying skills. And I find that a fascinating uh, field. It's very interesting to take uh, a theory, if you will, see that theory applied to a brand new airplane, and then go flight test that airplane and compare it with predictions and, uh, and see if the flight test results actually match the predictions. The F-22 is revolutionary in its design. There are no apparent fuel tanks or weapons. They are carried internally. The surfaces of missiles are highly reflective and storing them inside the F-22 helps hide the plane from enemy radar. In the main weapons bay, we can carry six AIM-120 radar missiles. And in the side weapons bay, there's one on each side, we can carry one AIM-9 missile. So we have a complement of eight missiles and an internal 20 millimeter Gatling gun, similar to other fighters. Once the aircraft is targeted and the pilot selects a missile and launches the missile, then very rapidly the door for the side that the, the, the missile is selected will rapidly open up, the missile will be ejected, and the door will close. To further reduce the Raptor's radar signature, making it more stealthy, the lines of the F-22 are angular. This shape deflects radar signals, making the aircraft radar resistant. Stealth is somewhat like the Klingon cloaking device from the, from the Star Trek series. It doesn't 
really make you invisible, but it's so close to invisibility that if you can imagine a large airplane like a 747, relatively speaking, an airplane like the F-22 is somewhere between the size of a bumblebee and a small bird in its relative size to that 747 airline. If you pile up all of the breakthroughs that are incorporated in the F-22, stealth leads the list. Stealth's a great equalizer. It's the sneak up behind the guys and shoot them before they know you're there. It makes war really terrifying. The end result of that is going to be it's not going to be fair, and we don't want it to be fair. It's now 15 hours before flight time. Will the F-22 measure up, or will it throw a curve at the man in the cockpit, causing him to face a $70 billion disaster? No matter how efficient the aerodynamics, or how advanced the avionics, there's no substitute for raw power. The F-22 packs two Pratt & Whitney F-119s, engines designed specifically for the Raptor. It had to be affordable, lightweight, thrust was important. It's a powerful engine for the airplane. Uh, that's, that's the key here. Uh, the engine, it's, it's been stated and written, is a 35,000 pound class engine. Uh, it has a lot of thrust. The big key is supercruise, or the ability to fly supersonically without the use of afterburners. Paul Metz took the airplane off, and he had two Chase F-16s following him, and the F-16s had to go into afterburner to keep up with the aircraft in a climb. That's, uh, that sounds good, it's spectacular, but it's real. It's, we do not need the afterburner to do a lot of things. That translates into longer range, less fuel consumption, so the aircraft can stay in the air longer, can fight longer. Avoiding afterburner also makes the plane less susceptible to heat-seeking missiles. And the F-22 is equipped with thrust vectoring, the ability to change the direction of the thrust as it exits the engine, which helps to steer the plane. Think about the air conditioning slots in your car. You turn them, you turn it up, you turn it down, the air blows up, it blows down. Well, we do the same thing in the airplane. We can vector up and down. How do we do it? Well, there's two big flaps back there that go up and down. It's as simple as it gets. Thrust vectoring lets the plane take off faster, increases agility in the air, and gives it the ability to fly at extremely steep angles, known as high angles of attack. While other jets will stall or lose control, the F-22 is able to maneuver with abandon, a major advantage in a dogfight. Thrust vectoring also improves the Raptor's stealthiness. The movement of the engine exhaust nozzles makes it harder for the enemy to spot the F-22 with radar and infrared detectors. The instruments in the F-22 are also revolutionary. In combat, information about the enemy can make the difference between being the attacker or the target. The F-22 will give future pilots an enormous information edge through an innovation called sensor-fused avionics. On a single screen, the F-22 pilot can receive data from many information sources, ground and airborne radar, as well as other F-22s. All the data is instantly compiled and presented on an easy-to-interpret visual display. With one glance, we can spot fellow pilots, enemy targets, and enemy planes. Good guys are green, bad guys are red. The F-22 pilot can even determine the number and type of weapons the enemy planes are carrying. Sensor-fused avionics has never before been done. There's not another airplane out there that does what the F-22 does. The aircraft is projected at this point in time to become operational, deployed to the forces in 2003. Uh, it's a build-up test uh, program starting now in 98, where we'll be looking at basic flying performance of the aircraft, and then that'll be phased into an avionics development program 
And then what we'll be doing is working with the operational community with weapons integration type testing. It'll take four to five years to get to that point, but when it's deployed, it'll be a fully operational, ready to go to war airplane. The F-22 has been in development for over 25 years. Back in 1972, almost immediately after the F-15 Air Superiority Fighter went into service, Air Force brass began making plans for their next generation fighter. The concept for this fighter of the future was called the Advanced Tactical Fighter, or ATF. In 1986, the Air Force took an unusual step and ordered actual working prototypes from two competing companies, a kind of duel. Four years later, the top secret prototypes were rolled out. The Lockheed Boeing General Dynamics team built the YF-22. The Northrop McDonnell Douglas team built the YF-23. The two airplanes would face off in head-to-head -head competition. The stakes were enormous. The winner would be awarded a prestigious and highly lucrative $70 billion contract. Both teams carried impeccable credentials. The YF-22 group included Lockheed, who developed the F-117 stealth fighter. Boeing, who had significant expertise in avionics and advanced materials. And General Dynamics, who designed and built the F-16. The YF-23 team included Northrop, whose F-5, F-20, and B-2 bomber made the company a leader in fighter design and stealth technology. And McDonnell Douglas, whose F-15 has never been shot down in combat. Each team's ATF prototype pushed the design boundaries even further. At the same time, Pratt & Whitney and General Electric competed for the engine contract. The fly-off began in September 1990. The two competitors were judged on the key flying qualities, maneuverability, supercruise, and stealth. The engineering and manufacturing plans were also carefully considered. Lockheed's written proposal was over 20,000 pages long. An intense but friendly rivalry developed between the competitors. There were 74 flights scheduled for each plane, involving various tests and establishing an awesome 70 degree angle of attack. The fly-off was indeed a high pressure environment. We had about 90 days to demonstrate those airplanes from scratch, from the first flight to the most we could extract from them, 90 days. When we had a common problem, like we had common engines, we were free to discuss it and make sure that we didn't have a safety issue. There was a friendly rivalry amongst uh, professionals who had known each other for many years. We knew we were up against a darn good airplane. Uh, we never gave those guys anything but the highest level of respect throughout the whole thing. We knew we were in a in a fight to the end, and it, I think it raised us to, to even a higher level. We knew all the pilots, you know, we'd meet out in the parking lot, and rib each other and have a good time. I wanted to beat him fair and square. I didn't want to win because they dinged one of their airplanes. So we worked together a lot on safety, and we even flew a, at least one formation mission with them, just for, mostly for PR. I knew I was in for a fight. I knew they would do a good job, and they did an excellent job. They, they had the second best airplane in the world. Both teams were very aggressive, and they went out in, in what, in retrospect, uh, now looks like a tremendous amount of flying uh, to very high speeds, in the case of the F-22, to very high angles of attack. They both had exceptional fine flying qualities. The shape of the, the airplanes are both unique. In fact, if you look at them, they are they are stealthy airplanes. Uh, they're what we call edge-aligned types of shapes. The, the leading edges, the trailing edges, they have common uh, lines to them. Both of them have uh, smooth, curved shapes to them. All those contribute to the stealth of uh, the airplane. Both planes performed flawlessly, and there was little difference in the test results. However, in August of 1991, 
the Air Force made their choice. The winner was the YF-22, built by the Lockheed Boeing General Dynamics team. Pratt & Whitney won the contract for the engine. The final report indicated the decision was based on more than just flying. It noted that the YF-22, quote, clearly offered better capability at lower cost, thereby providing the Air Force with a true best value, unquote. Of course, the decision also left the YF-23 test pilots without an assignment. But Paul Metz was uniquely qualified to change teams. I knew Dave Ferguson, the pilot of the YF-22, very well, known him for years, but of course, in that environment of competition, we were separated uh, in terms of, uh, of our exchange of information, although we remained friendly. But one day, uh, Dave and I got together and we said, look, Dave, uh, somebody's going to lose this contest, and whoever loses it will put a resume on the other pilot's desk the next day. So the very next day, I gave Dave Ferguson a resume. Today, the ghostly shell of the YF-23 sits alongside the runway at Edwards. The YF-22 program moved forward rapidly, but in April of 1992, disaster struck, and the program came to an abrupt halt. Test pilot Tom Morgenfeld was performing a routine flyby in the YF-22 so that photographers could get publicity shots. And uh, lit the afterburner and picked the gear up, and about that time the airplane made a rather pronounced dive towards the runway. Pulled back on the stick and uh, the nose started up, but it was, it was pretty obvious that I had a problem with pitch control on the airplane. Things happened pretty quickly after that. The YF-22 began to oscillate wildly. Morgenfeld had a choice, try to fly out and risk a catastrophic disaster or attempt a crash landing. It is not uncommon in the early development phases of a program to have accidents because of things we didn't understand. He wandered into an area unexpected that we hadn't really thoroughly tested and simulated and ran into a, a bucket of snakes and he had seconds to decide what to do with that airplane. Uh, he made the decision thinking that something had gone terribly wrong with the airplane to put it down on the runway so that we'd have bigger pieces to analyze later on. That's not untypical of test pilot thinking. He wants to bring the thing back so people can figure out what went wrong so we can fix it next time. Nobody likes to ever ding an airplane. Up to that point, I don't think I'd hardly ever scratched the paint on an airplane in 20-some years of flying. So no matter what happens, you always feel very, very badly about that. So, so much human effort goes into something like that that uh, you feel very responsible. I think there's a, uh, a saying that any landing you can walk away from is a good one. I wouldn't call that a good landing, but it was, it was certainly, I walked away from it. Actually, I ran away from it. <laughs> Analysis of the accident revealed the source of the problem, a simple bug in the flight control system. Even though this was easily fixed, the incident served as a graphic reminder of the dangerous game that test pilots play. I certainly don't believe that we fall in the category of some of the thrill seekers that you see that are always uh, jumping out of balloons or uh, jumping off cliffs. I enjoy uh, riding a mountain bicycle, you know, I ride a, a mountain bike, I enjoy scuba diving, but I wouldn't put flying uh, military airplanes in the same category as some of these thrill seeking junkies that you might see out there. We don't just strap on the airplane and go out haphazardly and test. And that's why you don't see uh, a lot of uh, mishaps, hopefully, in the test world. Because we do plan uh, the mission very precisely, against predictions. We know exactly what to expect, and we execute it very professionally. Darkness is now falling over Edwards. It's 10 hours before flight time. An early start is critical in the desert. Airplanes don't perform as well when it's hot. The F-22, 
perhaps the world's most advanced flying vehicle is being prepped for a critical test flight. But the development of new technologies is not limited to the plane itself. Computers and the digital age have affected many aspects of the F-22 program. The flight operations function has moved from markers to computers, from 12 people to two. This innovative part of the Raptor test program is called Ops Online. Using this system, schedules, reports, maintenance, and pilot and aircraft availability can be checked instantly. In the flight simulator, new capabilities and adjustments can be experienced and tested with complete safety. As we develop the various versions of the software for the airplane, pilots would go back to the simulator and verify and validate that software. And of course, participating in that, as well as all of these other training activities, have made me very well prepared to fly the F-22 the first time. In a novel approach to flight testing, the entire fuselage of the Raptor has been attached to the nose of a Boeing 757 to form an airborne test laboratory. The Boeing company had the number one 757 that all the development for the 757 program had been done on since, uh, since the early 80s. Because of the way the wings were joined, what we have is an airplane that could not be certified. So it was offered to us, to the F-22 program, to make a flying test bed. This is uh, like uh, buying a, a Lincoln Town Car to, uh, to, to do package delivery business in or something. It probably doesn't fit. It's too luxurious a vehicle to do this, but we had the opportunity and the cost was nothing. The 757 is equipped with 1,200 feet of lab space, 35 engineering workstations, and a complete F-22 avionics suite. Engineers can fly for nearly 10 hours gathering and analyzing data. Future plans call for a wing that matches the F-22 to be fitted on top of the 757 to further enhance the testing of the Raptor avionics. Everything from the F-22 that's required to make the radar and other avionics systems work is on board that 757. So when we test something there, we know what we're testing is actually going to respond very closely, if not identically, to the way the F-22 would respond. And we do it with 35 people on board instead of one pilot talking to some engineers on the ground. When you take off with an F-22 to do a radar test or some sort of systems test, what you've got on the airplane is all you're going to have for that flight. You can't make a change and then test it again. You've got to land, make the change, reload the software. 5.7, we can make a change real-time and test the results almost immediately. That's going to really affect the efficiency of our test program. Over the years, the world of flight test has catapulted dramatically forward, and the Raptor is as far away from the first warplanes as an ox guard is from a Ferrari. In the early days, World War I airplanes were used only to gather intelligence on enemy troop strength and location. The planes were unarmed. But things changed quickly when machine guns were mounted on the planes. At first, the weapons were fired from the rear of the aircraft. Then a Dutchman named Anthony Foker designed a mechanism to allow the firing of the gun between the propeller blades, and the era of classic dogfighting was born. Early aerial combat was brutal. The life expectancy of a World War I fighter pilot was just 17 hours in the air. Pilots quickly realized that speed and maneuverability were matters of life and death. The objective was simple. Move into firing position faster than your enemy and pump bullets into his airplane. During the Second World War, the battle for air supremacy reached a fever pitch. Old Fokker triplanes and Sopwith Camel biplanes were replaced by Spitfires, Messerschmitt 109s, and P-51 Mustangs. 
fighters now dueled at speeds exceeding 400 miles per hour with powerful rapid-fire machine guns and cannon. Technology improved, but the theory was the same. Maneuver quickly, get your opponent in your sights, and blast him out of the sky. By the war's end, the American P-51 Mustang destroyed almost 5,000 enemy aircraft. During this time, even the concept of stealth didn't exist. Early British advances in radar provided vital information on the location of attacking German warplanes. After 1,700 German planes were shot down during the Battle of Britain, Germany aborted invasion plans and the tide of the war began to turn. During the Korean War, a new breed of lethal jet-powered fighters battled for control of the skies. U.S. fighter pilots flew the highly maneuverable F-86 Sabre, and despite being outnumbered and outgunned by the Soviet-built MiG-15s, the Americans shot down 739 MiGs and lost only 78 Sabres. The Sabres were vital in protecting U.S. planes operating along the Yalu River. So we'd set up a screen along the alley if the MiGs tried to come across, but then if you could see them, uh, why well, you'd go after them, of course. And that was basically World War II type dogfighting, except we had jets, and you're going at a much higher speed. You were still using World War II type equipment, though, in that you had uh, six 50 caliber machine guns. And one of this remote control stuff, where you see a plane, you fire a missile, and it goes out and does the work, you had to get out and maneuver somebody else, get right in behind them and uh, come into 500 to 1,000 feet out, close on them, and get them that way. The F-22 is, is going to have a lot of advances as far as maneuvering goes, but it also will have a lot of advances as far as uh, missiles go, too. You're better prepared to uh, shoot planes down from a standoff position maybe tens of miles away. It's possible to shoot an airplane down without ever having seen it and flying straight and level. So uh, the whole thing has gotten on a more, far more scientific and remote, uh, remote control basis than it was back when I was doing test work. The Raptor Lieutenant Colonel Rainey will fly today is significantly different from the YF-22 demonstration plane. The F-22 is lighter for better performance. The shape of the wing and the horizontal stabilizer have been changed slightly to improve strength aerodynamics and stealth. The cockpit has moved forward and the engine inlets have moved back, giving pilots better visibility. The vertical tails are shorter than before. Originally, the tails were very large to prevent spins during the early tests. To me, this is a very aesthetically pleasing airplane. It's particularly pleasing in the air with the gear up, the doors closed, it's very pleasing. The YF-22 prototypes were retired after the crash in 1991. The first flight of the production model, Raptor 001, was on September 7, 1997, at Dobbins Air Reserve Base in Marietta, Georgia. Ironically, the aviator chosen for the honor of flying the mission was former F-23 pilot Paul Metz. With total emphasis on a safe flight, there wasn't much time for excitement or reflection. You're so focused making a first flight that you don't allow external uh, thoughts to creep in. You've practiced it, you anticipate all the emergencies. You're very focused on what you're going to do in those next few seconds and those next few minutes. So you don't allow yourself the luxury of uh, thinking about things beyond the immediate realm of the cockpit of the flight that you have to undertake. Raptor 001 was then shipped to Edwards Air Force Base in California. In all, nine Raptors will be built for the six-year test program. The success of which rests on tests like the ones that Rainey is conducting today. For today, uh, we're planning uh, initially on going to 35,000 feet at 0.6 Mach and conducting what we call a flying qualities maneuver block. We do what's called a doublet. 
and that's to see the general response of the airplane. There's a pitch doublet, which is simply a pulse on the stick forward and aft, and the airplane should be well damped. What you don't want to see is the airplane go into a large oscillation that diverges. That would be unacceptable. Once we do that, we'll do wings level side slips. That means I'll step on the rudder pedal to the right and slowly bring the nose of the airplane to the right, but not allowing the aircraft to bank. And then we'll roll 360 degrees to the right, but I will stop the roll. We call it a check, a full check. So the airplane will roll 360 degrees to the right, and as it gets to the 360 degree point, I'll abruptly put the stick full left so that it doesn't coast, it stops. What we'd like to see is the response from the airplane to see that it does crisply stop and doesn't uh, cause a lot of oscillations. The last thing we plan on doing is what we call the emergency landing gear extension. The landing gear is uh, normally hydraulically operated. There are several cases that might call for us to do an emergency landing gear extension, potentially a hydraulic failure. And that pretty much fills up the test cart. That's what we'll be doing today, hopefully. Data from the ground computers will be gathered and compared to information from the computer system on board the plane. One of the significant differences between the F-22 test plane and future production models is the high degree of instrumentation. There are more than 2,000 gauges and sensors placed under the skin of the test plane. The first airplane is instrumented for structures. And so there's a, a great number of uh, little devices on the wings that measure the acceleration or the forces on those wings. And they're all over the airplane. And we look at acoustic levels, we, how much vibration is going on in the airplane. Uh, the instrumentation level fills up numerous huge data tapes. The amount of data we gather is incredible. The ground crew has been working all night. With less than two hours before takeoff, tensions are running high. As the F-22 stands poised on the ramp, there's a vital detail that can be ignored only at great risk to pilot and plane. The runway. Before every flight of the F-22, the ramp and runway are painstakingly cleared of potentially lethal foreign object debris, or FOD, in what's called the FOD walk. These motors uh, have a lot of sucking power, and we cannot afford damage to the motors. So we go through and ensure there's no FOD on the ramp, no one has dropped anything, and there's a lot of equipment being moved around on the ramp, and uh, I'm sure there's nothing there to uh, cut tires and also that the engines can suck up. And we do that every time that we're going to go fly. Every pilot must perform a final walk around. Rainey looks for anything loose or leaking, anything out of place. Next stop, life support. Rainey dons another vital part of the F-22, his flight suit. This new suit is specific to the Raptor. It's even a prototype. It's designed to provide a controlled cockpit environment. This hooks up to the aircraft environmental control system and provides cooling air uh, to me uh, to, keep, to keep me cool in flight. In fact, our entire life support ensemble is uh, unique to the F-22 and it's designed to provide additional G tolerance or, or fatigue tolerance uh, under higher G. But as you see, as I start putting on these layers and layers of G protection, uh, you start to really look and feel like the Pillsbury Doughboy. All of this stuff is man-rated now. It has been tested by subjects in the laboratories. So what we're doing is testing it in the environment that the airplane's gonna be. Now we're ready for this thing. You wanna put this on? Now, what I'd recommend you do The F-22 helmet is new as well. It's designed to withstand pilot ejection speeds of 600 knots. This helmet has built-in active noise reduction to block out the roar of the jet engines. The quiet aids the pilot's ability to focus and concentrate. Final checks. 
all systems are go. While Rainey will be physically alone in the plane, he actually has an entire team with him every step of the way. From engine start to touchdown, his flight is monitored, instant by instant, by the crew in mission control. In the unlikely event of a problem with the flight, they will prove invaluable in guiding Rainey and the F-22 safely back to Earth. During a test flight, I am a test conductor. Within the control room, we have about uh, anywhere from 38 to 40 engineers. I am the one focal point that speaks to the pilot, clears the pilot for the test points. And if for any reason we have any trouble or problems, I pass that on to the pilot and just pace the overall mission. Basically, it's like a three-ring circus. And you'll look around the peripheral, there'll be uh, representatives from all the different uh, systems. There's flying qualities guys, there's structures guys, there's engine guys, and then my guys are across the front, all the subsystems guys. And basically what we're doing is we're sitting there and we're watching the system health from, from the first APU and engine start, takeoff, landing, and uh, engine shutdown. We're just making sure that the systems are operating as they should be. I like to think that we're an extension of the pilot in the control room. Um, he, he relies on us uh, because, face it, he can't be an expert on a, on a system that's as complex as this. If we see a, an anomalous condition in the air, based on the instruments and data we have, we try to keep the pilot out of trouble. eyes and ears designed to ensure a safe test flight are those in the F-15 or F-16 chase planes. I periodically check over the aircraft itself to make sure there are no leaks, there's no panels coming loose. Whenever he lowers the landing gear or raises the landing gear or something, I slide in and take a look to make sure that it's all where everything should be. And lastly, we have a photog with us. The photographer is documenting in still and video the aircraft and this both uh, we're taking both uh, public relations kinds of shots and documenting anything that might happen if uh, if we're doing engine tests we want to document the nozzles opening and closing and make sure that there's no puffs of smoke etc in this program we have an airplane that can clearly outperform the airplane you're chasing with he can out accelerate me he can he will be able to out turn me he can fly slower than I can, and there's nothing more awkward than an airplane that flies slower than you and you're trying to figure out how to stay behind him. You don't want to spit out in front of him and then have him do a rapid turn and run into you. So you have to stay clear of him, and the, the mismatch of aircraft performance is, uh, is always an interesting challenge. Rainey taxis out and stops near the runway. Communication links are tested. This is the final moment when every system is checked to ensure that the optimum safety levels have been achieved. The pilots call this place, Last Chance. When it taxis out, the last chance is the last chance for the maintenance to look at the airplane, to say yes, it's airworthiness, tires are good, and uh, we do a general look over. It takes a few minutes of the open areas, and he also performs some flight control checks for the control room, or they might have him look at, at different items, and they also say, we're ready to, to go uh, enter the act on the runway. And uh, they do that after I had cleared him, and I say, yes, uh, the airplane looks good from the ground uh, portion of it. And then uh, he says he's ready to go. Rainey is now ready to take to the air and risk his life in an unproven new system.
Rainey has performed his last chance tests. Mission Control clears the planes for takeoff. The test is a go. The first plane to take off is an F-15 chase plane. It's his job to make sure the immediate vicinity is cleared, and then he circles back around in order to film the F-22 takeoff from the air. Rainey now has the F-22 right where he wants it, in the sky. During the test, the control room monitors Rainey's and the Raptor's every move. Rainey works the F-22 through the various test cards, always alert for unusual behavior. Rainey climbs to 35,000 feet. He begins with some simple maneuvers, gradually increasing the difficulty. The first series of tests involve basic flying qualities of the Raptor, learning about its handling at various subsonic speeds. Eventually, the Raptor will fly at twice the speed of sound. Next comes a test of increasingly steep angles of flight. But ultimately, the Raptor will have an unlimited angle of attack. Rainey then moves the Raptor in various ways to test the responsiveness of the jet in its flight controls. Next, the Raptor is sideslipped. The plane continues to travel in one direction, even though the nose is pointed in another. Rainey and Mission Control are pleased with the results. Throughout the flight, the many sensors on the skin of the plane are receiving data. Avionics are checking out. The new flight suit and helmet are working well. Vital in any engagement with enemy fighters is the ability to maneuver quickly. The plane must be responsive to the pilot's slightest command. Rainey rolls the Raptor first 45 degrees to one side, then to the other. Then a 180 degree roll. Followed by a full 360 degree roll, first one way, and then the other. The Raptor's primary fuel tanks are internal, which increases its stealthiness so in-flight refueling becomes critical. By refueling the jet in the air, the range of the F-22 is extended without compromising its ability to stay invisible to enemy radar. Rainey tests the in-flight speed brakes. The flight computer instantly coordinates several control surfaces. The ailerons move up, the flaps move down and the rudders swing out. The Raptor continues to perform flawlessly. The final maneuver tests the emergency landing gear. If the pilot loses his hydraulics during a flight, this system allows him to lower the wheels. So far, so good. After one and a half hours, the pilot and the plane return safely to the Earth. The emergency landing gear disables the steering, so the Raptor is towed back to the hangar. So now Steve Rainey can relax.
Oh, it's, as always, flying is fun. If, you, if it's not fun, you're not doing it right. For now, the pressure is off the pilot, but not necessarily off the plane. The task of interpreting the enormous amount of data gathered by the instrument at F-22 begins. A computer is rolled to the plane, and more information is downloaded. It's time to debrief. Test pilot Rainey and chase plane pilot Beasley's first-hand impressions will be added to the computer data. With each test flight, more and more is learned about this latest flying marvel. Knowledge that will be used to expand both the safety and the effectiveness of the Raptor. In the 21st century, more than 300 Raptors will join the arsenal of America's Air Force. I don't want to send my son out to do battle in anything less than the very best equipment I can give him. Uh, obviously this kind of technology takes a long time to develop, so you have to have the will. If that will is there, I think this airplane will develop into a tool which cannot be matched by anyone else on Earth. I feel very fortunate and very lucky to have been the first Air Force pilot to fly the F-22 what I'm most proud of, it's being a part of a team that is bringing together a national asset that will ensure air dominance for my kids, your kids, our grandkids in the future. Eventually, the F-22 Raptor will be the fastest, smartest, and most lethal object in the air, providing America's military with the ability to dominate any future air struggle. And the men and women who will fly these missions will know that their safety and their success are due in large part to the courage of a test pilot.